What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Stanley Johnson was given on June 5th, 2012. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our devotional. Today we will have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Stanley A. Johnson, a professor of ancient scripture. We welcome his wife, Leslie, who is seated on the stand, as well as their family members and friends who have joined us today. Stanley Johnson was born and raised in Southern California. He attended Mount San Antonio College in California before serving in the Great Lakes Mission. He then continued his education and soon transferred to Brigham Young University where he met his wife, and together they graduated from BYU with bachelor's degrees. After graduation, they moved to Arizona, where Brother Johnson taught seminary for the church educational system. Meanwhile, during the summers, he was able to obtain a master's degree from BYU in sociology. After six years in Arizona, they moved to Utah, where he worked on his doctorate in education at BYU while teaching at Springville and Orem seminaries and eventually institute at what is now Utah Valley University. Upon completion of his doctorate, he was hired to teach religion at BYU in the Ancient Scripture Department. He received the Carl G. Mazur Excellence in Teaching Award in August of 2009 and currently serves on the Materials Evaluation Committee for the Church. Brother Johnson and his wife Leslie are the parents of six children who have all graduated from BYU and I'm told are true Blue Cougar fans. They are also grandparents to 11 with one more expected soon. And now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Stanley Johnson. Brothers and sisters, I'm definitely humbled by this opportunity to speak to you today. As you can imagine, I've lost a lot of sleep over this uh, preparation time. And when I'm done, you'll say he should have slept. Um, <clears throat> I, I, nevertheless, last evening, my granddaughter in uh, Oklahoma, Ari, called me and wished her grandpa good luck several times. And so that has helped a lot. To begin with, I feel like it's important to explain something to you. Um, for most of my life, I grew up without a father's influence in the home. Uh, so I turned to the leaders of the church for guidance. I have read over and over again the talks given by general authorities and other leaders from a general conference and on other occasions. This council has guided me throughout my life as a uh, father would have. And therefore, I'm going to be using uh, quite a few of uh, their remarks and quotes this morning. It was years ago when I was a young father that I went downstairs one day to our oldest son's bedroom. Uh, he was very upset and I and had been crying. I was there to try to give him comfort and find out what was wrong. As uh, we were talking, he confessed that he'd told a fib to his mother. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, Dad, it's so hard to be righteous. Well, this caused me to turn my head and smile because uh, he was very young. And then he said, life is like climbing over a wall, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> for a moment, I was completely stunned. And uh, I, I thought, how can he have such insight? We continued to talk, but the rest of the conversation is kind of a blur. I'm hoping on my part that I, uh, in my conversation, included how the Savior makes it possible for him to repent of his fib to his mother and any other mistakes he had made. I also hope I taught him about the importance of listening and following the promptings of the Holy Ghost. In January of 1980, President Marion G. Romney, uh, then a second counselor in the First Presidency, was, uh, gave us a message called the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He stated his conditions worsen. Uh, it is apparent every day that we are on a collision course with disaster. 
And I am persuaded that nothing short of the guidance of the Holy Spirit can bring us through safely. He then explained a profound truth. He said, if you want to keep and uh, obtain and keep the guidance of the Spirit, you can do so by following a simple four-point program. One, pray. Second, study and learn the gospel. Third, live righteously. And fourth, give service in the church. President Romney is then continued, if you will do these things, you will get the guidance of the Holy Spirit and you'll go through this world successfully, regardless of what the people of the world say and do. What a wonderful promise that is. Brothers and sisters, I would like to just insert again, listen to what he said. You will go through this world successfully, regardless of what the people of the world say or do, if you can obtain and keep the guidance of the Spirit. Before I continue, I, I want to say that nothing happens without our Savior and Redeemer. I, it reminded me this morning as I was here on the stand thinking about this experience, my favorite quote ever given at a BYU devotional by President, then President Ezra Taft Benson. President Hunter later felt it was so important that he included it in a conference address. It goes something like this. That man is greatest and most blessed and joyful whose life most closely approaches the pattern of the Christ. This has nothing to do with earthly wealth, power, or prestige. The only true test of greatness, blessedness, joyfulness is how close a life can come to being like the Master, Jesus Christ. He is the right way, the full truth, and the abundant life. I think I need to bear witness to that before I continue in bearing witness to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. For it is because of Christ that all this is possible, but through the Holy Ghost, we then can be guided and directed properly. So as I read these words, I recall King Benjamin's address to the Nephites and their subsequent conversion. And they all cried with one voice, saying, Yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us. We also know their surety because of the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. It is because of Jesus Christ and through the Holy Ghost we can change. We can change completely and we can stay changed. I remember President Benson saying, when we choose to follow Christ, we choose to be changed. We do not need to be a part of this world that is on a collision course with disaster. The key is to obtain and keep the guidance of the Spirit of the Lord with us continually. While working on my doctorate degree in 1984, I was uh, taking a course in education. One day, my professor broke from the lecture and he said, he asked the class, how one obtains and keeps the Spirit of the Lord. Many comments were made in mem by members of the class and finally, uh, I shared what President Romney had stated in, in 1980. I recited the four-point program for obtaining and keeping the Spirit. When I had finished, the professor leaned against the chalkboard, looked down at the ground, and said, No, that's too simple. That's too simple. I reflected on his comments over and over again, thinking about the story of Moses in the wilderness when he raised the brazen serpent. The, is the rebellious Israelites were bitten by the serpents, and the Lord told Moses to fashion a fiery, fiery serpent out of brass and place it upon a pole, and all who would look upon the serpent would live. The Book of Mormon carries on the narrative and explains uh, what happened. He sent fiery, flying, flying, flying serpents among them, and after they were bitten, he prepared a way that they might be healed. And the labor which they had to perform was to look. And because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, many perished. It was too simple. There you have it. 
brothers and sisters, too simple. Therefore, many perished. Remember, President Romney, too, spoke of the simpleness when he said, if you want to obtain and keep the spirit, you can do so by following this simple four-point program. The first point is to pray. Even though the idea is simple, it requires our whole being. President Henry B. Eyring once stated, the Lord offers us the covenant to always remember him and the warning to pray always so that we place our reliance on him, our only safety. It is not hard to know what to do. The difficulty lies in praying always. And all this is a needed spur to try harder. The danger, he says, lies in delay and drift. Let me repeat that. The danger lies in delay and drift. Remember, it's not difficult to know what to do, but the difficulty lies in actually doing it. Years ago, uh, Elder Gene R. Cook of the 70 presided at a state conference when I was the stake president. In the Saturday adult session, he challenged everyone to prayerfully select someone who would not normally attend state conference and invite them to conference the following day. He then asked them for a raise of hands for a commitment and counseled the congregation to pray themselves through the experience. He then said something I will never forget. He said, we should learn to pray ourselves through each day. Those five words, pray ourselves through each day. I remember as a stake president, he even looked at me and he said, President, learn to shake hands prayerfully. And I remember that. Uh, that helped me greatly as a president. He also turned to me and asked me to prayerfully select someone that I should bring to state conference the following day. I would like to share that experience with the person that was involved. As you can imagine, uh, I immediately started to pray myself through the experience. During the uh, process, the name of one of our neighbors came into my mind. She had been through some challenges, so I thought it would be a good time to challenge her. And so Elder Cook and I walked across uh, the street, and I asked her if I could visit with her. President, she said, do you know how many people have already been here? <laughs> I said, uh, no, and she said, five, with her hands outstretched. I remember thinking, well, so much for revelation. But Elder Cook didn't miss a beat. He grabbed me by the arm and he pulled me in close and he said, ask her if we can speak to her. I did and she invited us downstairs. As we descended down the stairs, Elder Cook turned to me and asked, are you praying yourself through this? <laughs> I, re I remember thinking, what do you think? <laughs> when we got down, settled down on the couch, she started to talk uh, to her eye to eye. Uh, he asked her what her maiden name was, and she told him, and then he said, calling her by name, I know your parents uh, really well. Are you from, and he named the location. She said, yes. I know your dad. He's a stake president. Yes, she said. Elder Cook then proceeded to chasten her firmly and calling her by name again, saying, you know better. Tears flowed and commitment followed. At the beginning of the experience, I thought I had made a mistake. But the Spirit had guided us there by praying through that experience, and doors and hearts were opened. I, I bear witness to that, brothers and sisters. Learn, we need to learn to pray ourselves through each day. Amalek stated the idea of continual prayer this way. Yea, when you do not cry unto the Lord, let your heart be full, drawn out in prayer unto him continually, for your welfare and all for the, also the welfare of those around you. The Savior said, Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must watch and pray always, lest ye enter into temptation. Notice, not enter into sin, enter into temptation. For Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Recently, our youngest daughter, who's out there somewhere, uh, was sealed to a fine young man in the temple. And at that time, they were admonished to pray next to each other with their arms and hands intertwined. 
Begin and end your day, he said, by giving thanks for another day together. As many of you are at the same stage in life, how important it is to pray for the Spirit of the Lord to protect and guide you and uh, your little kingdom. Prayer should be an important part of each and every day. Elder Bednar has said, quote, meaningful morning prayer it is an important element in this spiritual creation of each day and precedes the temporal creation or actual execution of the day. Just as the temporal creation was linked to and a continuation of the spiritual creation, so meaningful morning and evening prayers are linked to and are a continuation of each other. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, my morning prayers have changed because of this counsel, and it has quite an effect upon me. In fact, my wife can bear witness that each morning I go in and uh, get on my knees and plan the day spiritually before I actually live it. And it has been a great blessing. Years ago, President Kimball stated, prayer is such a privilege to speak to our Heavenly Father. It was a prayer, a very special prayer, that opened this dispensation. It began with a young man's first vocal prayer. I, I found that has been a great blessing in my life, to pray vocally. Whenever I start losing direction or attention in my prayers, to, to pray vocally. Then he said, I hope that not too many of our own prayers are silent, even though when we cannot pray vocally, it is good to offer a prayer in our hearts and in our minds. This little bit of advice really has helped me to commune with our Father in heaven. It has enabled me to concentrate better and speak with instead of to our Heavenly Father. In this same message, President Kimball also suggested that we do some intense listening at the end of our prayers. The second point in the formula is to study and learn the gospel. As a young family, our family was growing up, like many of you, we would have scripture study in, early in the morning. Uh, and that meant uh, our children were not always very alert. In fact, my oldest boy is here and he tells me that he got to hate to hear uh, rise and shout, the cougars are out, because that's how I would wake them up. He said, <laughs> I grew to hate that song, Dad. <clears throat> we sometimes wondered if anybody was listening, let alone learning. My wife and I felt a little relieved when Elder Bednar shared the following statement in general conference about his family. Quote, if you could ask our adult sons what they remember about family prayer or scripture study or family home evening, I know how they would answer. They would likely, likely would not identify a particular prayer or a specific instant of scripture study or an especially meaningful family home evening lesson as the defining moment of their spiritual development. What they would say is that they remember is that as a family, you remember this? We were consistent. We were consistent. Sister Bednar and I thought helping our sons understand the content of a particular lesson or a specific scripture uh, was the ultimate outcome, but such a result does not occur each time we study or pray or learn together. The consistency of our intent and work was perhaps the greatest lesson, a lesson we did not fully appreciate at the time. That's the end of the quote. One day, our second son came home from his early years in seminary and gave me a drawing of the plan of salvation. It was well done. He had the premortal existence, mortality, and life beyond the grave, including the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdom. He did, however, get those two reversed, I must add. He... He even had himself holding hands with the Redeemer in the celestial kingdom. I then asked him how he knew the plan so well, and he said, I don't know, Dad, but I want a candy bar. <laughs> <laughs> he then said I was the, and then this, this really got me. He said I was the only one in class that was able to do so. 
hopefully had learned it in family scripture study or family home evening, even though we weren't uh, sure they were learning anything at the time of uh, the events. I must state one morning we were having scripture study, and I'll never forget it. One of our boys fell off the couch, sound asleep onto the floor. <clears throat> President Ezra Taft Benson once said, when individual families and members immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, other areas of activity will automatically come. I love it when the brethren say things like that. This will automatically happen. And then he said, testimonies will increase. Commitment will be strengthened. Families will be fortified and personal revelation will flow. I, that just solidified in my mind the importance of Scripture study. Our family needed to be fortified. Your families need, will need to be fortified, brothers and sisters. Testimonies will need to be increased. Personal revelation needs to flow. And... I bear witness to these principles as we study the scriptures, uh, revelation will flow. Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 4.16 that the outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I love that scripture. Elder Jay Jensen once and I were traveling home. We were working on our doctorate degree, and he shared that with me, and he said, that, that is of late my favorite scripture. I, I think it's become one of mine. We are renewed day by day. How important it is to renew ourselves day by day. My experience has been that personal scripture study is a powerful way to renew ourselves day by day. I would encourage you not to miss a day. In fact, Bishop McMullen once in our conference, state conference, shared something I've not forgotten. He stated, look, you read your scriptures each and every day, and some days there just isn't time. He said, then simply open the book that day and read a verse. You can do that. Just read a verse. And he said, that way you'll keep the scriptural habit going. I, I bear witness to that. President Boyd K. Packer once stated, when you feel weak, discouraged, depressed, or afraid, open the Book of Mormon and read. Do not let too much time pass before reading a verse, a thought, or a chapter. Brothers and sisters, make yourself familiar with the scriptures. Apply them to your own life. They should feel as comfortable in your hands as a, well, a pair of uh, well-worn tennis shoes do on your feet. I feel it a real blessing in my life to be able to teach from the scriptures at this university. I know without a doubt they are true. There's power in the word. They will help us to feel the guidance of the spirit in our lives on a daily basis. I am positive of that. I know that's true. How can we live righteously, which is the third point President Marion G. Romney uh, presented. Repent of your sins by confessing them and forsaking them. Live righteously, it seems to me, really can be summarized in one word, repent. Nephi taught his posterity that we are saved by grace after all we can do. Well, what's all we can do? The king of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's gives us some insight in a sermon delivered to his people. Quote, and now behold, my brethren, since it has been all that we could do, as we were the most lost of all mankind, to repent of our sins which we have committed and to get God to take them away from our hearts, for it was all that we could do to repent sufficiently before God that he would take away our stain. I, I've got to say, inserting this, I'll never forget a talk by President Hinckley where he called the problem of pornography the world's slow stain. I thought that was an amazing metaphor, the world's slow stain. So we, we can have that blessing. Repenting really is all that we can do. 
President Henry B. Eyring gave a devotional talk here at Brigham Young University that had a powerful effect on me. He told of a young man who had needed to repent, had come to him when he was a bishop. After a lengthy time, Bishop Eyring had interviewed him and found him worthy to hold a temple recommend. But the young man was now going to be married in the temple to a young lady who was sweet and clean, and he needed to know if his sins had been remitted, if he had forgiveness from the Lord, not just from his bishop being cleared, but from the Lord. How could he get the revelation? Bishop Irene said it was a good question, and he needed some time. The young man gave him two weeks. During those two weeks, Bishop Irene had a family reunion that then pre Elder Spencer W. Kimball attended. He found Bishop Irene and he said, Hal, I understand you haven't, you're a new bishop. Is there anything you would like to ask me? He said, I said there was, but I didn't think this is the place to talk about it. He thought it was. It was an outdoor party. This part cracks me up. My memory is that we went behind a shrub. And there we had our interview. Without breaking confidences, I outlined the concerns and the questions of the young man. Elder Kimball, I asked, how can he get the revelation? How can he know whether his sins have been remitted? I thought Elder Kimball would talk to me about fasting or prayer or listening to the still small voice, but he surprised me. Instead, he said, tell me something about the young man. I said, what would you like to know? He then began a series of the most simple questions. Notice how many times that word comes up. Simple questions. Does he come to priesthood meeting? I said after a moment of thought, yes. Does he come early? Yes. Does he sit down in the front? That's no reflection on you in the back, by the way. <laughs> I thought for a moment, and then I realized to my amazement that he did. Does he home teach? Yes. Does he go early in the month? Yes. Does he go more than once? Yes. I've got to insert that would disqualify me there. <laughs> I can't remember the other questions, but they were all like that. Little things, simple acts of obedience, of submission. And for each question, I was surprised that my answer was always yes. Yes, he wasn't just at all his meetings. He was early. He was smiling. He was not there not only with his whole heart, but with the broken heart of a little child, as he was every time the Lord asked anything of him. And after I had said yes to each of his questions, Elder Kimball looked at me and then very quietly said, there is your revelation. This is repentance, brothers and sisters, the mighty change of heart. Again, what is it that we can do? It is to repent. And this young man did, not only with his whole heart, but with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. The scriptures remind us of the Savior's words, repent and I will receive you. Come unto me and ye shall partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Yea, ye shall eat and drink freely. Yea, come unto me and bring forth works of righteousness. By repenting, we are living lives of righteousness and allowing the Spirit to help us to change. The fourth point in obtaining and keeping the Spirit is service in the church. Does the, the question is, does service bring the Spirit or does the Spirit cause one to serve? The answer is yes. One day in my office at seminary, I was speaking with a, a student when I started to go numb down one side and then the other. For some time, I was in a semi-conscious state. When I finally regained full consciousness, some of the effects of, uh, were persistent headaches where nothing seemed to help. I was the bishop of our ward at the time, and the headaches were so intense that I decided to sit down and have a talk with our stake president, President William A. Cox, who I was able to visit with last evening. I explained to him that I was experiencing extreme headaches. Even though I did not ask to be released, I knew, he knew why I was there. Finally, he leaned over the desk and said, I'm not going to release you, Bishop. 
He then continued, a loaded train doesn't jump the track. Well, that certainly made no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> Fortunately, President Cox explained that what he meant. He had been, uh, for a long time, he worked at Geneva Steel controlling trains that transported uh, the steel. He said, when a train is loaded down with freight, it will not jump the track. Only when the boxcars are empty is the train liable to leave the tracks. He then reinforced his statement that he would not release me. I did not fully understand the principle until later. As I would go to conduct the interviews still with headaches, I found myself so involved in the work that I soon didn't even notice them. It wasn't long before they lessened in intensity, and I have now all but forgotten them. The principle in this for me was serving others brings the spirit into our lives and helps us to remain on the straight and narrow path, especially during times of challenge and stress. Moroni and I lived during some very challenging times, and Mormon, his father, gave him some advice that is helpful for all of us to remember. Let us consider this scripture and how it applies in our lives. And now, my beloved son, notwithstanding their hardness, let us labor diligently. For if we cease to labor, we should be brought under condemnation. For we have a labor to perform while in this tabernacle of clay, that we may conquer the enemy of all righteousness and rest our souls in the kingdom of God. Note that his advice was much like President Cox's advice. No matter how hard it gets, just keep working and serving. Why? The blessings will come. Well, there you have it. Four ways to obtain and keep the Spirit in your lives. Prayer, gospel study, living righteously, and giving service in the church. So are we on a collision course with disaster? Yes. The world is. <clears throat> Must we live in fear? No. Jesus told us, be not afraid, only believe, and see that you be not troubled. As a watchman on the tower, President Mary G. Romney told us that if we have the Spirit of the Lord, we can go through this world successfully, regardless of what the people of the world say or do. That is quite a promise, and it is true. We can learn a lesson from the Israelites in the wilderness. If a prophet of God tells us that we can look upon a brazen serpent and be healed, then we can look upon a brazen serpent and be healed. If an apostle of God tells us we can obtain and keep the spirit of the Lord by following four simple points, then we should believe it. Remember, Alma taught his son Helaman, by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. Brothers and sisters, I know these principles are, are true. I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to share them with you, and I leave this testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This BYU devotional address with Stanley Johnson was given on June 5th, 2012. Thank you.